three, three, are there three venues or maybe only two venues? There's not very many uh, venues left where you can actually go and play in a public uh, location. So us and, uh, oh, maybe there aren't any more. Who else is still open they, now? They well, well, well uh, uh, Sid, Sid will actually do by reservation, and it happens still on a semi-regular basis uh, uh, up in Minneapolis. Yeah. Um, I think we are. Montreal we're closed. We're, we're the only. New York City. I don't know that he's ever actually managed. He's not really public. It's more of a club. Right. Yeah, I think we. And yeah, Pharaoh doesn't have his. Yeah, and then just thinking about all the whole list of all the different people that, yeah. that have because we know all of these people. Yeah. And I think. I think nobody is actually. And nobody else is actually open in a, in a public mm -hmm. space where you can just go in and, and be able to play. To be answered. IO compatibility. It took half a year for these official surveys to start coming in. The local life on Vulcan was dynamic. Survived past one generation. Houston city limits. Turn right onto West Road. What appearance, not just. Realistic robots slash androids. The comedy version. Turn left, then the destination is on your right. Is it going to become yeah, a there we go. I glared at the mini Garfield. Because I've got Dirty primary control of the plasma cannon. Yep. Garfield grinned back at me. Oh, God. That's a terrible right. name for a restaurant. Oh, fucking A. With decades of right, yeah. to look forward to. Laser tag? Yeah, maybe we should have sent some spare bombs yep. along. I reached over and expanded the list window. Well, let's get started then. 21. Riker. January 2157. Seoul. If you start with 100 planets, remove the Jovians, remove the... It's got fucking seven displays in this thing. Oh, perfect. Oh, wow, you've got quite the setup. Yeah, this is, um, uh, so the things that were here are here at Battlefield Houston. You've got the, the VR suites, and then has all of the arcade games, and then the, I don't remember how big the laser tag arena is. 15,000 square feet, two stories. Wow. It's a big, big laser tag arena. Um, so. All right, well. So you have a lot of stuff you can do here. Uh, it's you guys. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Uh, no. <laughs> However, <laughs> you guys are socially distant away from us. Yes. <laughs> um, it's just the two of them. I'm gonna move this camera a little closer. Can you hold this for a second? Sure. Let me know when. Click again. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Great. Uh, and that's that's going. Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. 
so tell, tell me about yourselves, uh, about uh, who, who you are, your call signs, uh, uh, your um, your company here, uh, just in general to start out. Yeah. yeah. You want to introduce yourself and then I'll... Um, my name's Alan, I go by the call sign Muerte. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm Steve, call sign uh, Frog, so that's spelled a little odd, you know, P-H-R-O-G-G. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we started up what is now known as Metcore. 15 years ago so we were we were regular players we played a lot over at uh, Dave and Buster's and even before that um, Muerte was was playing at uh, a place here in town it was called uh, Exilorama and uh, it was over in one of the malls and they had a like a half Quonset HUD yeah. and all of the de decor and all that kind of stuff and actually they had called it a Battletech outpost yeah they had a battle because it wasn't outpost. a virtual world <laughs> store Right. So they had to come up with something else. Yeah, so, so if you've seen the, um, the history of Virtual World, there was a, a, a special that just recently came out. So there were, there were the Virtual World centers, but then there, this one was a different. This was an outpost. Right. It was a little bit different within, uh, within Exilorama. Um, and that was the, the older style uh, pods, what we call the, the, the 3.0 pods. The, the, uh, we often call them the coffin pods because you get in, sit down, and close the door over your head um, at, within that. Uh, and so you were playing over there and had played that for a while, um, and then it all of a sudden disappeared one day. Disappeared. It just <laughs> went away. Right. Um, and then, um, and then one day, uh, I, I hear from him that uh, um, you guys all need to come over here to Dave and Buster's and come play this game um, because he had found it actually up and running over at Dave and Buster's. Was it actually the still the three O pods at that time? Or was it? it? Well, from what I understand, they moved the square pods over to David Buster's, but then shortly thereafter decommissioned the 3.0 because they had these brand new round uh, 4.0 pods, uh, which was running, and you know, new and improved software and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, I seem to remember when we first went there that as you walked down that hallway to the midway, they were off to the left, mm -hmm. and then they moved and were back in the back. So mm -hmm. you know, maybe I think that may have been when that when that happened. But basically, we got together, um, lots of people getting together at lunch every Friday. We actually from all over the city, we would go over to Dave and Buster's and meet at lunch on Friday um, because that was the least expensive time really to actually play. Uh, when you got into the evening hours, the prices went up. They actually priced it by the points and you had to buy points and the points were more expensive in the in those times that kind of thing so um, so we got together and played and we did that for years that was 98 97 six five six and seven yeah so yeah so you know we're talking 20, 20 years ago um, and so we were, <laughs> that's right so we played regularly doing that um, but one of the one of the issues was that they were not um, they didn't understand that it, as much that it wasn't an arcade game. It's not it's not about being an arcade game and sending people over there to go play by themselves, right? It was it's a not, multiplayer it's game. It's not Pac-Man. It's not something you can set up by yourself. Even it's something that requires an operator. It's something that's an experience, um, and it's not something that um, that you win at the game. Every time you play, it's different. It's uh, it's something that you're doing. It's actually a social activity, and so just like you, we get together and play Monopoly. We don't get together and play Monopoly in order to, you know, finally six hours later be the guy that won at Monopoly. Where we play Monopoly because we're doing a social thing with a bunch of our friends. We get together and play D and D as a social thing, you know, with with a bunch of other people. And they didn't get that. I'm oh, oh, sorry. The management didn't get that, um, and so we started talking about we were doing we were doing tournaments. We were actually doing invitationals at other places around the country where we get together with the other teams and other at other locations. Um, you know, we were doing masters trials and and things like that. What was the so we have the we had the invitational and the regionals regionals. So we could do that. So you could actually get you know different awards that were all there. Um, but um, they, they just didn't understand how to build that community that was within all of that. So we sat down, we, had, we were having lunch at CeCe's or something after a 
swap meet or something that we went to and we got to talking about um, that we we could do this better we could have a storefront we could have a place where everyone comes together and we understand that there's a community that needs to be fostered to be able to bring people together to, to do this um, so we thought we'd sit down and we wrote a business plan about how to do it um, what what it would take to put it all together um, reached out and contacted virtual world and said hey how much are a set of pods and, and they were like um, anywhere that Dave and Buster's is they have an exclusive in that geography for being able to use it so you can't buy any right you, oh. can't, you can't have it in Houston. Yeah, you can't have it in Houston. Right. Like, well, we don't want to go elsewhere. Yeah, we're not like <laughs> moving somewhere to go and do this. So, um, so we said, well, okay. hmm. and went on, and then, you know, an eight, a year, eighteen months later, uh, two thousand four. No, wasn't that big? Two thousand, yeah, maybe two thousand four. The end of the Dave and Buster's agreement. Yeah, Dave and Buster's. Um, I believe it was two thousand five. Okay. Well, because we actually purchased them in 2005. Right. Um, the, the, the contract was ending. We heard it in 2004. We knew that it was coming up in 2005. Yeah. And so we we heard about it through the grapevine, contacted them. They said, well, yeah, there's, you, there were, I forgot how many sets. Maybe 12 sets yeah. or something. So one, one, uh, one plan was they were going to sell each one individually and have the idea of you could have a pod at your home and at some point you could connect this through some other server and everybody could play. Sounds like an interesting concept. It says, but the problem was they needed to get them out of all those stores quickly. So they said, well, preference to those who want to buy the entire sets. And that's when I went, Frog, you want to call now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so we um, uh, we thought about it, we talked about it, we went through the, the plan and uh, tried to make a decision on it, and we finally made the decision we were going to go ahead and do that. And so we said, well, we'll call them up tomorrow and and uh, and, and and get this set here. Uh, in Houston. In Houston. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, it, 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 we turned around, called them up the next day, and it's like, oh, we sold those last night. <laughs> when we didn't go ahead and call, somebody else did. Um, so the, uh, a group of guys actually up in Dallas, um, they actually um, uh, were able to buy them. That's uh, what is now known as VG Core. So VG Core actually bought those pods. So we're like, well, where else are there are there uh, are there pods available? And so we had uh, they had uh, Cincinnati was available. So we actually said, well, fine, we'll figure out how do we transport them from Cincinnati. Let's get a quote from that. And so we, we got a quote together for being able to do that and, and sign the sign the contract to actually go ahead and buy the pods in, in Cincinnati, had an 18 wheeler meet us there. And uh, we both flew up there while they, they actually, part of the contract with uh, uh, Dave and Buster's, they actually disassembled them, took them all apart, <clears throat> which was the most uh, educational day uh, for us to actually have the guys who built the software, built the hardware, be the ones to actually take it all apart. So Firestorm, who you see it now, it's called Valtech Firestorm. Firestorm is a software developer who put all this stuff together. Um, and, uh, oh my gosh, it was Scarab. Scarab, Scarab who, was the, who did a lot of the hardware. Um, so the two of them came, met us there, disassembled everything, showed us around the whole thing as we were going through it all. Um, and we got it all up and loaded up on that, on that semi. And, Headed back here and then met them here three or four days later, um, and and uh, we had actually talked to a uh, uh, a venue in town here called Track 21. So they have a it's an indoor karting track. So it used to be a Kmart, now it's an indoor go kart track. And we uh, we we thought we'd try to see if we could pitch to them because it was conveniently located to where our houses were. <laughs> that was really the big thing. It was very conveniently located to where we were. And so as we're going to sit down and try to explain the whole thing to the guy, the guy comes in and he's Came like... Came up with all this literature. Yeah, we had all of the things to try to explain it. The whole book Drawings and, and all this. <laughs> And he comes in and he's like, 
Dude, McWarrior, the pods, I would love, that would be great. I mean, he actually was a player. Okay. That's like, oh, forget all this. We don't, we have, we got all this stuff we've been preparing for, for weeks. And he was like, that would be great. We'll do it. And so we, we found a spot within there to, to set aside, uh, to be able to make that into our, our place. And we, uh, got in there with, um, all kinds of fun things. And we actually got the, you know, concrete saw out and cut the, Cut a channel and put power in, and it, it was a it was a lot of a lot of fun, a lot of work to be able to do. But we actually got up and running. I don't remember when we were originally buying them, but we actually got that up and running, everything ready to go, and we opened up the weekend after Thanksgiving. Uh, weekend of. Weekend of Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah the weekend of Thanksgiving in 2005. Mm -hmm. um, so this is now. 15 years, right? And we've been doing this for 15 years. And at the time, I don't know that I had any think, any belief that it would be something that would last more than about five years before the technology would just be past it. We're sitting here in a VR suite, right? You know, doing this right now where, where we are in our, in our new location. And we're in this VR suite with the headsets and stuff like that. And still, um, everywhere we go, these things are just so popular and it, and, and the graphics have moved way beyond what it is that we have here. It doesn't matter. The same thing that we said back then about this is a community game. This is about getting together with a bunch of your friends and doing something together, not about having the best graphics, not about being the fastest, uh, you know, software or any of those kind of things. So it's very, it's 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 really interesting how it all you know continued uh, to go, and that uh, even there's probably been two or three times we've talked about, you know, it's like, well, maybe it's time to, to shut down and, and those kind of things and our and our um, our regular people won't let us do it. It's like <laughs> like I'll step up and I'll take care of party planning. I'll step up and I'll so we have everybody who's working and, and doing those things, they're all they're all volunteers. There's nobody gets paid. Nobody makes any money. We haven't made any money. <laughs> um, so it's it's something that we do. We try to keep it at break even. Uh, COVID is not helping that right now, <laughs> but we try to keep it at break even um, and and get through. Um, so anyway, we, we we put it together there at, uh, at Track 21. Um, started growing from there. What are, what's some of the next milestones? We uh, how many different locations have you guys had been in over the past 15 years? This would be the third. Right, as far physical as physical location, location. Yes, yes. yes, but we have done conventions where yeah. we, where we, I mean, that started in uh, 2007. Seven. Alcon, yes. 2007. Yeah. And who's, so at who, Rice who, University. Who's, well, how did that idea come about to start doing conventions? Because these are not, you know, these are not designed to be moved around. <laughs> they are not mobile. No, <laughs> they are non-mobile, mobilized. Uh, so we, we heard from, you heard the main VG Corps, uh, they were doing a convention, an anime convention up in Dallas. And we heard all of the um, pain and agony of trying to disassemble <laughs> the pods to go to a weekend convention to disassemble and bring them back into their store over a weekend. We, we they, didn't, they didn't even have a double door. Right. They had to disassemble yeah. the physical pod down to where they could From actually go. Parts. Sorry, this camera. Uh, no, never mind. It's yeah. good. No, it's because uh, I turned the app back on when you find it. Oh, ah. my bad. Okay. That's, that's our view. But, but they, they didn't have a double door, so they had actually taken the pods physically apart, physically down, breaking down, way down to the more cabinet. than we ever go down. Breaking the cabinet down, down into the parts. To be able to go through the door. They actually talked about the fact that it would be a lot easier when they, after they did that to just simply have a glazer come out and remove a window um, <laughs> than, than what they did. Um, to be able to get there in and out of that whole thing. But, so what, I, but what brought all this on was we our uh, our venue was on a major highway. Thousands of advertising, thousands of signs, uh, lots of flashing lights, all this kind of stuff. And we we kept saying, well, we need to put out advertising, so we need to put out a sign. And we kept going, why? I mean, nobody is going. First of all, Metcore at the time. There, nobody knew what that was. I'm sure there's some people now who still do not think that. But the deal was that we kept saying, we got to get out advertising. So what, what is going to make people understand? Well, there are these, these, there are these capsules that you sit in and you shoot your friends. Okay, that doesn't go over well. Uh, well, giant robots. Well, okay, that might get some people's attention, but you got to 
you'd have to see that. And then with all the white noise of all these different signs, you know, what kind of a billboard's gonna stand out on this highway? Yeah, we, yeah, do you have one that has giant robot combat simulators? I mean, how, how, right. big, a, how big a sign do you need to be able to try to explain right. what it is that you, that, you, <laughs> that you have going on? So when, the, when we heard about VG Corps taking them to conventions, that was like, that's it. If you can't drag your customers to your shop, you shouldn't drag your customers to your shop. Take, take the mountain to Muhammad and say, let them see it there. Because just, just to see these capsules, uh, I'm sure we're gonna see some capsules here on the video. Uh, it's just, they look intriguing. It's like, what is this? And then you see people come out and, and playing and laughing and you know talking smack to each other. And we went, okay, how do we get them to different locations without taking the cabinets apart? And we finally came up with a way to make them mobile in one piece, roll them in. We, we made new chassis for them, put them under the air, and they, we've modernized them, customized them a little bit, just enough where it's more uh, easily moved to from location to location. We, we, uh, we're, we're on Mark three of the chassis now. Right. <laughs> and now we're ready to go to Mark four to yeah. deal with some and, of the things that have happened there. <laughs> and we've, we've had different trailers. We started off with, with my personal flatbed trailer. We moved to like U-Haul trucks. We moved to just just imagine trailer. though a, a, a flatbed car hauler open. trailer, open trailer with four of these pods going strapped on freeway. it, going down the freeway in Houston. That's what we did the first Nose time. Nose art on the sides, <laughs> all the stuff strapped down, heavy duty. Have strapped. you had any incidents moving the pods around? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we went uh, we went from that trailer to uh, I'll, I'll tell you what we went to a uh, uh, to use in uh, liftgate trucks. Um, and then we ended up with a 48 foot trailer uh, that we have a 48 foot enclosed trailer and a 28 foot enclosed trailer. The, the, the lift gate trucks, one of the problems is that the pods are really, really top heavy. Lots of stuff up in the top. There's a big monitor at the top. It's all heavy there and then seating down below. So there's just not much down here. It's all up above. And the and lift it's gate- seven foot tall. Yeah, it's seven foot tall. And so the, the lift, and it's also three, and a half feet wide. Mm -hmm. So the lift gate is eight foot by four foot and you put the pod on it and then you lift it up and the lift gate always kind of lifts up a little bit of an angle and then goes. And now you have an 800 pound pod that barely fits on the thing where somebody is trying to figure out how to keep it from rolling off the, the, the lift gate um, as you go. So, and, and the lift gates don't go up, they go up like that. And so now we've got this, this big heavy thing. And we did that, um, did we do it three times maybe mm -hmm. total um, before we said, all right, somebody's gonna get killed. That's right. We're just gonna, st <laughs> we're just gonna stop doing this. This is too dangerous. If we have a dock, that's one thing, but we don't have a dock to be able to work from. So we're gonna not use the lift gate anymore. So we ended up buying the, uh, buying the trailer. And so we have a car hauler trailer. So big door down, enclosed. we can roll up, it's all enclosed. Oh we actually went through and modified it specifically to handle what it is that we were doing. So it's got e-track at different locations and we have all of the, uh, the locations all set so we can get it in, go in, clamp it, get it done. Um, but there have been times. Um, so one of the important things for us in the trailer is to make sure that we actually go ahead and, um, so we're strapping around the bottom and holding it up against the wall but then we actually have uh, hooks that we put up at the top and we strap it to the wall on either side so that it actually doesn't, can't fall over. Um, we did have, we've now had one incident where we forgot the straps on one of the pods and had the pod fall over, um, which, um, you know, spilled its guts all over the, all over the trailer, all the electronic guts. So that one, that happened on the way to Dragon Con. Was that on the way to Dragon Con, guys? I yeah. think it was on. Yes, it was on the way to Dragon Con, and we actually got that pod repaired, resoldered all the wires, got everything up and running while we were at Dragon Con. I think it might have missed half a day of operating before we got that back. But the other thing that we found out is that the the wood of cabinet. the cabinet itself is not intended for the kind of load that we're doing when you're going across Louisiana on yes. the road. If you've like ever been this. on Louisiana, <laughs> the bridge across the swamps has a noticeable 
wave to it. And the candidates and don't like that. And it's doing that. And so that's when we found out. So what was interesting is in the original build, the the wood that's you know at, at that's uh, uh, horizontal, that is actually all plywood. The ones that are vertical that are taking all the weight, those are particle board. And so now as we're going and doing that, it's pushing against that, and they just all that we just had a had the whole cabinet collapse on one of them uh, on our way to. I don't remember. San Antonio. San Antonio? San Antonio? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the way there. So we actually, now we had to actually build a new structural support. So we actually have a new structural support that holds all of that up, keeps it all where it needs to go. But uh, we have had a, a few of those incidents. And then in, in, in San Antonio, that's where we went from Mark 1 to Mark 2 on our. Uh, <laughs> on the same con. On the same con, <laughs> on the wheels. Um, we found that um, wheels, they say they're rated for 250 pounds. The thing weighs 800 pounds. We have six wheels at 250 pounds. Should be fine. Um, math, math says. The math says they would be fine. But when the, uh, when the wheels themselves are actually on it, when, we, when you read on it, and it says, uh, Hecho in China, that may mean that they don't actually meet the specifications they're supposed to meet. And so on our way in, you know, we're going along, and it's just do, 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 and then the next thing you know, there's pieces of wheel just falling out from underneath the the uh, the pod as we get there. So we actually, at the venue, while the con is going on, slowly we go through and we jack them up after we go to Home Depot and buy new wheels and put new wheels on the whole thing to be able to get new wheels so that we can get back out to the to the trucks again to do that. And, and on our way to go get to the trucks, that's when we found that all of those wheels now had flat spots on them. <laughs> it just sitting there with people in them all that time, it was, was too much for it to be able to deal with. So. Um, so then we went to another set of wheels and then another set of wheels and we're finally at Mark three. <laughs> uh, what portion uh, of your business would you say is conventions? And um, uh, I know prior to prior to 20 yes, yes. Yeah. And, and it would be how you would define it. So I mean we're open every weekend here. We're only open a few weekends at conventions. We probably have done a maximum of 12, maybe 14 in a year, something like that conventions. From a revenue perspective though, the revenue all comes from the conventions. The conventions allow us to keep the store up and running. And would you say, it's also, it's, it's like an evangelism. Uh, it, it is, so we actually did that first one was at Alcon, which was here in Houston uh, at Rice, so Rice Owl, so it was Alcon. We went and did that one. That brought a bunch of people back into the store. It was a real big um, thing for us to be able to get people that, back in the store. That was the original intent. That was the intent as, as we did that. But then when you go to San Antonio, when you go to Austin, now when you start going to Atlanta, that doesn't bring people back to the store. We, but we made money at those conventions and that allowed us to actually operate a store, which allowed us to have people come in on a regular weekly basis and it helped us to be able to meet the rent that we needed to to be able to have the store. So we'd end up at a net zero. But if we didn't have the store, then we didn't have enough regular people coming who wanted to volunteer to come and help to be able to go to the conventions, right? So we had to do both in order to be able to to, to keep the business up and running. You, you brought, you're bringing people into the conventions and then you have a place for regular players to just build a community. That, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I always, I always uh, told my wife, I always wanted to have a restaurant, a cafe, I didn't really want to make money at it. I just want a place where all my friends come and hang out with me all the time. And she said, well, this way, you do this store and then I don't have to cook. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Since we're talking about making rent and uh, <clears throat> uh, the storefront business here, I, I wanted to ask about the price point because I noticed like, it's basically the same as what it was in the 90s as the, the, dollar amount wise. It, it, it is. So we actually still have the sign it, at, at our store. We actually had the sign from Exilorama here, the Battletech Outpost. We had that sign that was back in the back hanging up just because, just, uh, I don't know, we have a museum of everything related to um, <laughs> to this game. We, we have we have an entire storage space <laughs> devoted to uh, all the old stuff that, that goes along with this. We just um, what is it? We're not we're not hoarders. We're um, archivists. Archivists. Mm. That's it. That's the term. We're archivists of the history of all of this. Um, but but you know, here um, our our well, the pricing that we do typically at conventions is what it is that we're doing here at, uh, at at the new venue. So we moved here to Battlefield Houston in the middle of the middle of the year, um, and we're doing. Uh, I think it's seven dollars for a single game, and twenty-five dollars for a four-pack, and fifty dollars for a ten-pack. So you can basically get your games at seven dollars, six and a half, or or five dollars, depending on how many you buy at a time. Um, and that is actually potentially cheaper than what it was in the '90s. 
So in the 90s on that sign, it was $7 a game? Yeah. And if, if you if got you, it at the, at the lunchtime hour. At the lunch hour. So it actually was higher during other times. So Through the evening um, weekends. Yeah, so we've managed to keep that, that price point about the same. Um, uh, at conventions, that tends to be about the same price as well, although we actually did go up on the price at uh, Dragon Con. Dragon Con is extraordinarily expensive for us to be at, um, so um, so it ends up costing a little bit. We, we, we take all the, all the volunteers to go with us, and we have 15 people that it takes to be able to go run things at, at Dragon Con, and so um, hotels alone take up a you know 30 percent of whatever it is that we take in over there is just for the hotel so so and then we got to get there and get back etc so i'm sure you know uh, most new players of, of these spots these days are, are through the conventions um and, and i wanted to ask about first player impressions because i'm sure you see lots of people encountering these for the first time and if that's if that's changed at all since you started doing this 15 years ago or if it's basically people have the same reaction to it now as they did back then i I'm, honestly the it's always been the same uh, childlike wonder of going in and seeing this thing and I can sit in it and it's usually the, the families going, I can shoot him, yes, and of course we're gonna encourage that. It's like, hey, let's gang up and get that. That's right, that's right. <laughs> you, you and you kids go after mom and dad here and they'll love it and the parents love it anyway. And so uh, it's really, and what's funny is the parents are just in as much childlike wonder as the children <laughs> when they sit in this and going, wow, this, this was back how long ago? Wow, you know, and, and now, you know, we, you can tell from us when we hear, wow, th they made these when I was born. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> in the pot. So uh, it, even though they are now antiquities as far as uh, you know gaming is concerned uh, it still brings out a lot of you know wonderful memories we get people who come in and are just in awe that they're still around I remember when I played these back in the early 90s and I went to North Pier right that's right, right. Get no, that. every Montreal, somebody was and, at North Pier yeah, and I remember when these are in, were in Atlanta I remember Walnut Creek I remember, it's great to hear all those stories. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, it, specifically at Rooster Teeth Expo, there was one of those times, the first time we went to Rooster Teeth Expo, most of the things that are there at RTX are, are companies that are showing off their new games and that they're gonna launch, etc. And so we had people all the time coming in, they were playing it and they were just like, this is great, when are you guys launching that? And I'm like, before you were born, right? I mean, <laughs> honestly, it was launched before you were born. So, uh, um, you know, these kind of pods, like, these pods, this version of the pods, these are old enough to drink at this point. Um, <laughs> and this is version four. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was quite a ways back there at, uh, for in that. I got a question. Yes, sir. Have you had a particularly, like, far-flung person come to check these out and was just made like no. a... Well, does any do any stories stand out of that right? So we had a family come in from Australia. They came on vacation to the US and part of the plan of their vacation was to make sure that they actually they were actually doing stuff. They would hit San Antonio, they were gonna hit some things around that, but they made a day specifically set aside to, for the whole family to come to Metcore on a regulars night, which was a Saturday night, to come to Metcore to come and play all night long. And it was great, it was a, whole, a whole family from Australia that did that. The next week, a guy flew in from England to be able to come and play his, uh, um, uh, wife was at a bachelorette party and he was meeting her in Dallas in another another day so he he made his flight from England to come to Houston to come play Met, play at Metcore to play Battletech then go meet her in Dallas uh, I, I, that was two You're weeks so in a cool. row it's only about that far that's right it's only that far is when you're looking at the map right um, but um, but we had that kind of thing happen all the time and we still have um, at the same time, when you ask me about that, we have we have a lot of celebrities that, that you would know that love to come and play. So when we're at Dragon Con, especially, there's a lot of those folks who will actually make sure to come and play. Uh, name, name yeah, Jim, Jim, Jim Butcher oh. is one that loves to play the game, so he comes and plays. Um, we've had Steve Jackson play a few times. He's actually um, 
not a very good video game player, but uh, but he, the <laughs> idea, the concept is all great. Um, and he's Houstonian. So that's right. He's 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 Austin. He's in Austin. Well, maybe he is now. Yeah. yeah. But but he uh, um, he's come and played a few times. But we've got we have actually a whole binder full of autographed things. So when uh, when we have folks that are that are those celebrities, what was the the whole cast of Beyond Human? Was that what it was that all came and played? Yeah, one uh, Gotham. Gotham? Yeah. Oh, no, no, both. We both. had both. We had, <laughs> no, we've had both. We had both. There was, um, we met the guy that, that was Whitmer. one of them. Yeah, Whitwer. Sam Whitwer. Yeah, Sam Whitwer was at, uh, in San Antonio. Yeah, true. And then when we went somewhere else, he had the entire crew, and he brought them all in to come and play. <laughs> um, uh, Jay, uh, what's Jay, Jay, Jay and Silent Bob. Uh, Jay, uh, forgot his last name. Um, Kevin Smith. Oh, yes. no, wait, Jason no, 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 no. Muse. Jason Muse. Jason Muse. Um, Jason Mews, you know, he's been by to play a few times in, uh, in when we're in, uh, we've been in Houston. Um, so uh, it, it, there's lots of those different, lots of those different things that happen as we go along. So always, always fun to be able to get the, get those kind of things. And then, yeah. Tell, tell, tell them about the folks in, uh, was it New Orleans? Hypnotoad? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so that are the, sticks out or the, the, the Hypno Shelf. Hypno Shelf. Hypno Shelf. So we, we bought a Google Hypno Shelf. That's right. Look up Hypno Shelf, the Metcor Hypno Shelf, mm -hmm. and you'll actually find it. it. And so we had this shelf that I found that actually it's got, you know, curvy things and a motor, and so it runs and it just kind of sways. But when you're looking at it, it looks like the shelves are just kind of doing this back and forth as it goes. And so the next thing you know, we've got people who are just coming into the room and going, whoa. And, the, and now they're doing a hypno shelf dance. And now they're going and getting other people and they're actually coming in and worshiping the hypno shelf as they go through and, and do that. And to the point, you know, the, the there was next a thing, chant. That's right. <laughs> but the, you know, um, obey the hypno shelf. This is not a cult. Yes, that, was the, that was the chant that happened with that. But, the next thing you know, there's Hypno Shelf, Metcore Hypno Shelf has a Facebook page. We didn't create it. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> else created it. There's this whole fan group for the Metcore Hypno we, Shelf. We hear that even after the con shut down for the night, <laughs> th those who were dancing, doing the Hypno Shelf dance with the shelf, were going up into their own portion of the hotel, continuing the Hypno dance. And then we find out. Uh, I get a, a, a video from uh, a fan saying, are you guys at whatever convention was? We weren't there and there were still the followers of the Hypno Shelf doing the Hypno Shelf dance at a convention we were not attending. <laughs> yeah. And they right. come back year after year. Cool. Yes, yes, come back oh, yeah. year after year. Yeah. Yeah. They, they ask someone in the store and ask, yeah, we, we have, on the Hypno Shelf? We have tried <laughs> to continue, but the Hypno Shelf actually was not made for being carted around and it's broken and now now you turn it on and it actually kind of dances across the floor until it unplugs itself but uh, but uh, I don't know we were thinking maybe we faithful could, followers that's right faithful followers of the hypno shelf the queen of the hypno shelf is the um, I'd like to ask uh, virtual world LLC is not what it once was um, uh, what is your you know we're, we're, uh, the business model has changed over time you know we've got, we've got these inter, in, uh, independent centers now can you tell me a little bit what, about what your relationship is like with uh, virtual world LLC so so virtual world is actually still owned by uh, uh, Nick Smith so Nick still owns that um, it, it goes under the domain of uh, megjock.com now um, he still has all that intellectual property and then as a group um, you know all of the all of the owners, 12 of us, something like that. <laughs> we all know each other. We all work together on things. We still um, try to be able to keep that, uh, the community together as much as possible. We actually have a Facebook group together where we, you know, keep up with things that are going on um, and help each other out on lots of various different things. Um, but, but Nick has been, uh, been super supportive in trying to make sure to keep this up. If you think about a fan when this was going under, went and bought the whole company in order to try to make sure that it survived. Um, I think there were probably some thoughts that we would, there would be lots of people who would continue to buy parts and things like that. That didn't materialize. We all learned how to fix things and keep things going. Um, but as a group and as a community, it's been, it's been great. And um, we, have, we have gone through four, five, 
maybe five different revisions of the software in that time. So, um, so uh, Virtual World, MechJock uh, Mac, yeah, Mac is still making sure to help make sure that the, the community can survive, that the software is still there and still working, that we can continue to um, make changes to it, see uh, fixes happen for things every now and then. Uh, as we go and continue moving it forward. So right now, um, there's actually an effort to move it to a new enough version of v Visual Studio that we could actually run it on a Windows 10 platform. Mm. So when we started, we were able to get things from Windows 2000 to Windows XP, and that's where we are today, but we can't go beyond that because of a, one particular piece that's there. So one of the guys has actually taken and been able to port the code forward through all of the revisions of Visual Studio to where it works on at the latest, the last one that still works with Windows XP. And now he said, well, that next project, and it's gonna take me a little bit longer, is to actually make it so that the MFDs work and we can actually get to a point of uh, uh, moving into using more modern hardware, more modern software, uh, which we struggle having, we struggle to be able to buy old enough, not old enough, we struggle to be able to buy things that still support Windows XP, that we can still you know, make those things work. So we learn to fix things, we learn to do electronics repair uh, and keep those, keep those things working to be able to, 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 to keep it working. And uh, when you find a closeout on a whole bunch of uh, um, PCI 6200 or 7200 NVIDIA cards, well, you buy them all. Uh, I have a question. Uh, this is something that I wasn't able to confirm for myself, so I figured I'd ask you guys. Um, I know they used to have some centers in Japan. Yes. Uh, have you heard anything about that recently? Well, so there's not any centers there, but right. Freeze Moon um, actually has a set of pods over in Japan. So Freeze Moon was one of the regular players. He used to come over here all the time to play, um, but he's actually got, uh, he was unable to locate the pods that were in Japan. I actually have somebody who believes he knows how to find the pods in Japan. Um, but Meanwhile, Freeze Moon actually bought a set of pods, four pods from here in uh, the States and shipped them over to Japan. So he actually has a private set of pods in, uh, in Japan. So, so there is still a set there. It's in private hands, it's not public. There's only three, three? are there three venues or maybe only two venues? There's not very many uh, venues left where you can actually go and play in a public uh, location. So us and... Uh, Oh, maybe there aren't any more. Who else is still open I now? Think well, well, well uh, uh, Sid, Sid will actually do by reservation, and it happens still on a semi-regular basis uh, up in Minneapolis. Yeah. Um, I think we are. Montreal we're closed. We're the only New York City, I don't know that he's ever actually managed. He's not really public. It's more of a club. Right. Yeah, I think we've, and yeah, Pharaoh didn't have his in and just thinking about all the whole list of all the different people that, yeah. that have, because we know all of these people. Yeah. And I think, I think nobody is actually, and nobody else is actually That's open in a, in a public yeah. space where you can just go in and, and be able to play, well, theoretically any day, but right now we're only open on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just, just due to the, the, the pandemic side of things. Um, he does have other people coming that need to come in here in, in, a, in a few minutes. Do you so want to take a break? So we may actually need to, uh, move to, somewhere else? To move somewhere okay, else, so we may see you. what we need to do if we need to move somewhere else. All right. Um, gosh, okay, I'll one more question. <laughs> plenty, um, plenty, of, plenty of questions. I'm okay, really happy to great. answer questions. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm noticing with uh, yourselves and Nick Smith and your volunteers here, you know, is that it's kind of like this, this the, the company fell apart, but then all these people came together to try to keep the, the wheels on for as long as possible. Like and it's uh, I, it's beautiful. But well, even so, when we when we picked up these pods, that was you know, virtual world was selling it all off and was going to go away, and everybody came in and kept it going. Mm -hmm. And then even even with you know with we've thought about you know trying to shut things down and it won't let us. So um, you know even the pandemic, you know we we're just like well, we're not going to be able to pay rent anymore. It's like and so John's like I'll cut this wall out and we'll turn this room in and we'll have a place for you guys to, to come and do it over here whenever when this all blows over so um, we've just not been able to <laughs> to shut it down um, 
which is okay, I guess. That's that's all right. It's a, it's not a problem. Uh, I'd like to know a little bit about about your guys' relationship with the player community that you that you have around here. Like, uh, you've been are there people that are that you've known for fifteen years because of this? Or? Yeah, yeah. I would tell you that there's a lot of my of my friends at this point uh, have come from this. I, you know, you you find your friends in the different things that you do. And there's lots and lots of people that I know at this point that are uh, because of uh, of this game and because of this the, the, the venues of you know getting these things together. But even um, I was going to say there's there's three folks that we see a lot in the volunteer stuff, and we met them in Atlanta. It turned out that they lived down the road from where we were, um, but they came and saw us at a at a convention in Atlanta, and they were like, "You're you're you're in Houston. Where? We're in Houston. Where?" Well, we just live down the road, and so the next thing you know, they're on the road with us, going all over the place. Uh, you know, two of them get married. The other ones are, you know, we go off and we meet other other folks, and that and babies that introduces. Are so yeah. yes, so you, in movies, there's production babies when there's metcore babies. We actually have probably, we may have like four metcore marriages, yeah. and, uh, and and a few metcore babies uh, within all of that that have that have come together, um, where where people got together because got of together. because of the game. <laughs> uh, so I talked to Nick on, briefly on Tuesday, um, and he was uh, saying that you know when he purchased the company, he had some plans, but that at this point he's, he switched into more of a preservationist mindset. Uh, and then part of part That's of that archivists, yes, <laughs> right. uh, and part, storage room will prove that he's had so many people that loved these pods, uh, but had no idea they were still around in any capacity. Like right. a lot of people are just not aware. Um, and then on Wednesday, I visited the um, the National Video Game Museum in Frisco, um, and I was I, they have a VR exhibit, and there was not a single mention of any sort of device like this. It was all focused on head-mounted display type stuff. Mm -hmm. right. um, what can we do to preserve these and to not, and to convince people that it's worth? preserving. So I'll tell you we need to go and answer that question somewhere else because he oh, has people okay. coming into the All VR right. suite. So let's go All right. let's go out and let's answer that question somewhere else. Uh, 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 uh. He keeps walking behind you and going Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
without <laughs> without necessarily enough income <laughs> to to be able to do that. Sometimes it's just one of those things. It's what we want to do, so we're keeping it happening. One of the reasons I find these so fascinating is that you can see traits that would later become much more popular and normalized. Uh, it was it's, they were very ahead of the time in yep. a lot of ways. Uh, it worked. Yeah. What would you like to? Uh, what ways would you say they were ahead of their time? You know, being able to <clears throat> have a full cockpit, to be able to actually understand that you could, you know, have things running and how a real world situation would be. That it's interesting because we'll get younger kids who come in who've been playing video games all their lives and they don't know how to do anything that's not using a controller like this and they are just totally lost when it's like what 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 what, eh, what? and they they just it's like look look you know how to just subtly use your thumb on something just you know take it easy and use and and it's it's that that same thing of going into the from the digital realm to the analog realm and being able to 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 provide that uh and, and get through that what other things would be i mean <clears throat> the these the, the, the MFDs that are in here, right? So there's three MFDs in here. Three. There are five MFDs in here, three at the top, two at the bottom. Those are <coughs> black and white five-inch CRT TVs with a piece of green plexiglass over it. And all five of them run off of one video uh, feed. So there's one video feed where the left side of the screen is going to the... Top, I don't remember now. Top ones or the bottom ones. And the right side is going to the others. And we're actually taking and splitting in a cable, the red off to one monitor, the blue off to another monitor, the green off to another monitor. And But as they go in here onto a black and white TV, they all show up as white, put a green plexi on it, and now it looks green, right? And so we're able to, to, to do things like that, that that was way, that was a really great idea for somebody to come up with in the 90s to figure out how to be able to make these things work, to be able to do that. Um, that was. You have to realize also when when these when the three O pods were out, there's no VGA connectors on those. That's before VGA was a thing. This was right after VGA became a thing, and so taking that VGA connector, splitting it off to a bunch of monitors, to a bunch of TVs, and figuring out how to run 12 volt TVs in here to be able to run all of that, that was just way ahead of its time in figuring that out. Um, how about that they're all connected and they all share the same world? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So being network, being that all of these game. things are networked together, right? Um, that that you're in the same game together, playing in the same one together, and figuring out how it is to make all of that work. Um, you know, back in the old ones, you know, using the the I actually had a, a set of the three O pods as well, um, but they are, um, you know, we're, we're using a, a, a Mac with a Nobel server with IPX on it and everything. So now getting the modern modern TCP IP and being able to use the, uh, an IP protocol stack and being able to keep all of these things working to the point where, so we talk about a thing called SiteLink and that was in that, in that special as well, but we actually, after the pods were sold and we all took over as the, the, the sp split out uh, ownership of all of those things, um, we actually went and created recreated SiteLink and actually got it so that the different sites we could play together with, with each other. Um, so we actually put a, uh, a, a router out in the cloud. It was actually a, you could call it a firewall half link. So it was a firewall concentrator and then we would send you a router that had some software on it and it was the other half. Because um, from a networking perspective, you can't route what we're doing here, you have to bridge what we're doing here. So we had to build something specific to be able to allow that because it's a multicast uh, technology. Um, and then we were able to, you know, this is how when it was, AOL Instant Messenger, we were able to aim each other over at the other sites and get everything coordinated to actually get a game together with the people in New Jersey or the people up in uh, Minneapolis Colorado. or Colorado. So we, we've had games, <coughs> excuse me, where we had Houston and New Jersey and Colorado in the same game, which nowadays is like, yeah, big deal. But keep in mind, we have, we're running technology from the 90s. Right. When's the last time you guys played a network game? When's the last time that occurred? Network like SiteLink? Yes. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. We're all Sorry, network. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that would have been back in like 2010, 
Yeah, it's probably it's 10, years ago. Yeah, 10 years um, ago. So it was cool. It was neat to be able to do that. The reality is that this game is about getting together with people. It yeah. wasn't it wasn't as effective when you were remote from each other and you couldn't smack talk as well. You couldn't it wasn't the a- same thing. You can only do so much, right? Right. It really just <laughs> if, wasn't the same experience. If we, had, if we had Zoom at the time and could talk smack to each other live on TV. But the other thing was time zones. It's you know, we got New Jersey and Colorado. We got to make sure that we get online with them, and we. It's not like they can join in the game in progress. We have to wait. Everybody's in. There's one central hub where somebody manually puts in the parameters of the game. Are you sure you got everything? Okay. How about you? You got everything? All right. Now let's go launch. Yeah. And then ten minutes later, we got to do all that over over again. Yeah. So there had to be one console. Right. For everyone in all the different places, and so trying to coordinate what we were putting in the console amongst the different places at the same time. That was complicated um, and over AIM. You know, yes. If we did it today with Zoom, that might be different. And I really think that might be, I don't know, maybe we get back to thinking about how to do that at some point with all of the, uh, the folks that are more in, in uh, private locations as well now. Uh, but I could see it potentially being a thing because Sid does actually get uh, have open, uh, open on, a, on a regular basis. So maybe we he, he, we could do something there at some point, but there's lots of lots of interesting things that are going on, and and we are in an arcade. It is there is stuff that's going on yeah. back here in the back. We do what we can do <laughs> without um, all of that. So what, one of the ways that I, I think it's kind of ahead of its time, of course, people use call signs, for example. That was not a you know in the early '90s they, they, the pre Doom people weren't happy didn't have. But that's uh, now we've got everyone has a gamer tag, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, or the uh, pins. I would like to talk about the pins. It's sort of like a proto achievement system. Yes. Yep. You know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let me let me tell you about uh, about call signs first. So it was very interesting with call signs because we, all of us that played, we knew each other by call signs. We often didn't know each other's real names in a lot of the things that we were doing. I actually, uh, I have a great. It's a great story. I was off in uh, Atlanta at Dragon Con, and we had left. Um, uh, somebody back at the store who was actually operating some of the, the remaining pods. I think we only took, maybe we only took six. When did we take that? It was that first year. Maybe we only took eight. And so we, we probably eight. left eight yeah. back at the store right. um, to do that. And so Wicked is at the store and he's operating the console, but there's a problem. So he, he calls me up. Cell phone is just not working well at where we are in the hotel. So I said, hey, call me at the hotel room and we'll, we'll run it through there. So he calls the front desk. Ask for room, whatever we are, four thousand and one, and I need it. And it's like, and what? What's the? Uh, uh, what's the, uh, the? The name of the person? Frog. It's like, oh, that's not what I have. It's, it's frog. It's like, and so they actually went ahead and rang the room and said, "I have somebody who's calling for a frog." I said, "Yeah, that's me." I said, well, that's not what I have on the on the register. I said, "Yeah, I know." And she's like, "Well, hey, we need them to know the you know real name." I said. I don't know his real name. I don't know what you... <laughs> I mean, it's wicked, and he's talking to Frog. That's the way it is. And, and it's like... That's the way it's always been. That's the way it's always been. It wasn't until Facebook... You have to tell how long ago. It wasn't until Facebook, when we started getting together on Facebook, that we started actually learning our, our own friends' real names. We didn't know each other's real names. I, I just didn't... It didn't come up. Um, so we still change it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And, and so now we, we, you know, we can still change names and like, so Tiger over here, he's actually, he actually went through, changed his name to a new call sign and that, so he could run through the ladder matches again as a new, as a new call sign and try to get up, up yeah, so he could start at the bottom and, and work his way back up to the top. And he did that, by the way. So very successfully worked his way all the way to the top of our ladder. But did you challenge yourself? <laughs> No. I need the Spider-Man meme right now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, but then pins. So uh, you want to talk about pins? What, what, How many do you have talk? left first? Oh, well, <laughs> actually now that's actually just changed. So I actually just got a big batch of pins, but I don't have any of the low number of pins. So pins, we actually were doing pins at the 25 mission level, 50, 100, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 1,000. Um, and uh, I now suddenly have 
hundreds of the thousand and five hundred and four hundred, and then and then it drops off to almost nothing uh, of the ones lower than that. Um, and we actually did. When did we do? Maybe it was ten years ago. We actually did another run of the twenty-five. Did we do the fifties as well? Yeah. But we did the twenty-five pins. So the twenty-five pins, which was a Mech Warrior Guild, so it's different than the rest. It's a little Mech Warrior Guild pin, and then then it would start counting fifty and, and go up from there. Um, and so we did a, a we, we we ran out of those a long time ago until just recently, and that was because we you know we were able to get a stash of them. Thanks, Sid. Um, <laughs> so Sid, Sid was able to to, to get me a, a, his stash of pins that he had as a, as they were closing down the shop and moving it into their new location. Uh, uh, he was he was willing to, to sell me a lot of his uh, a lot of his goodies uh, that he had found squirreled away and, the, and those kind of things. So that was great to be able to have those. Uh, but there's a bunch of other pins that are out there too. So there's the pins for the nose art. So uh, do we have any other ones that were right here? here. But was there a Calamity Jane? Yeah, but yeah. A Calamity Jane, Jane and uh, and Martian Bell and Mistress Quickly. Um, yeah, we had they, pins for that, and then we did one for um, we have our own artwork. There's, so there's crazy. Attitude Adjustment, and then uh, Death from Above, which is in in, in trailer. the trailer. Is that what I'm wearing? You guys have yep. your own. You've done your own. So nose that's, art? A, that's our own. That's our own. Nose that's artwork. a real person. <laughs> really? Yeah. So this one here person. is that. Is yeah. that also? No. Is I, no, nope, so that actually represents somebody from the original video, okay. right. uh, from the original uh, uh, trailer video. Mm -hmm. So this is actually Dooley and Dr. McIntyre. Dr. Oh McIntyre. So this would have been uh, Judge Reinhold and uh, what was her name? Um, uh, oh my gosh. Judge Reinhold from Beverly Hills Cop. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So he was the one that actually played that. Play. So I'm glad you remember that one. <laughs> there you go. So I actually, uh, during Comic Palooza, he was going to be there. And so I actually grabbed the door from a 3.0 pod, which would have been what it is when he did those with big sliding doors that slid over you. I have one of those doors that we keep in the store. We grabbed that door and went over to his booth and, a said, door. and said, so. Do you remember what this is from? And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> but finally, when we, oh my gosh, the, her name is on the tip of my tongue. Joan. Joan Severson. Severson. When Joan, Severance. When I Severance. said, I said Joan Severance. He's like, oh, that video game thing, game thing that Tim Disney took us off to Australia to do all these things. Oh, oh my gosh. He's like, and so he he signed it. He signed it actually as a uh, as Doc. Uh, McIntyre. McIntyre, oh, thank you. Cool. As Doc McIntyre and then Judge Reinhold. So it signed as both of them with him. Um, so at, at, at that point, that's now become the um, the intended. I've actually, I can take little pieces of that off. And so when we see other people, other celebrities that were actually in that, if we get to, to Joan, if we get to Weird Al Yankovic. Uh, yeah, we Joan, if get, you're watching, we want to talk to that's you. That's right. We need a signature on this door. Um, but... but uh, uh, Harley Ermey was in it, Weird Al was in it, um, uh, Cheech Marin was in it, all those guys. So we're, I'm going to, that's my goal over the next, let's call it 20 years, <laughs> to, <laughs> to try to get all Soon. these people, <laughs> all these people to actually sign that door. Uh, I think that'd be really cool to be able to, to, to make that happen. But um, What's but, the other original nose art? You said the other original, here. so we have Attitude Adjustment that's over here. Um, and we call her, her name is Jackie. That's actually Jacqueline Trade is the name of the, the character that's on that. But that's an actual um, person that we met in the cosplay at uh, Dragon Con. There was actually, uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. And the other one, the other one we have, this is, this is uh, Dana. That is uh, that's, Death from that's, Above. No, that's Attitude Adjustment. Is that Attitude Adjustment? Yeah. <laughs> right now? Do we have any Dana ones? Where we, uh, maybe I, thought we about, have a, I thought about wearing. Maybe we have a pin. Sorry. Do we have some pins or something? Maybe. Yeah, anyway, okay. we'll, we'll get. We'll make sure okay. that you have something that you can use for that. We'll um, get you. Get you a picture of it. <laughs> but um, that's our, our death from above. Um, but those are those are both original original nose art that he drew. Much. So nice. he drew those. He, this is what he does for a living: is draw things like that, right? So. Um, uh, that, my screen's a little dumb. Oh, that, that lady, it's her, and she does have that giant wrench. Yeah, so, so if wow. you go if you go to our website, yes, she's actually on the front page of our website and our Facebook and things like that. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, Jacqueline Trade. What well, it, it was at at um, at DragonCon, there were a couple of our guys, 
in camo. We we all we have a tendency to wear camo. I'm sorry, I was at work and so I'm not in in camo today. But we we wear fatigues and that kind of thing. So when we go to a convention, it's a show. It's a production, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to make this fun, make this a production. We're all wearing camo. We actually got uniforms with patches and and pins, all that stuff set up for what it is that we do. Um, and we were there were a couple of guys that were sitting down talking about you know we need a mascot. We need somebody to be able to you know help from from that perspective. Somebody dressed like that girl. And so they actually said, hey, you should come back with us over to these pods. She's been traveling with us ever <laughs> since. <laughs> she is just absolutely, absolutely fit in with our, with our group. That's another example of somebody that we met on the road at a convention who now is at all of those things, out of those different conventions. I've got a picture with her in costume and me in costume at, uh, for like the last 10 years. Um, as we've gone to all of these different events, and she's she's come here to Houston, she's come to Austin, she's, and so traveling back and forth, uh, and as well as she lives in Atlanta, and so it's really easy when we whenever we're there in, at Dragon Con, she's always there with us doing things, um, and a great great um, helper for us overall, and then bringing other people in that, that are there, so getting there, uh, getting all of the other people together. Uh, that's great. Sure. Because uh, I got this battery sucks. I you just bet. Need to charge it for a half hour. Or... You bet. All right. Thank you. It's cool. Sure. This is a Here, really pause. Massage. I actually sold it to the guy in uh, Dallas. The guy in Dallas just sold his pods to the guy that I bought them from mm. in uh, California. So they're actually headed back to California. Wow. Um, <laughs> and uh, so now uh, Berserker has two of those ArcNet cards. Green Day didn't tell me that he didn't give us all of the ArcNet cards. He still has another ArcNet card in his, in his thing. So he will actually have three of the ArcNet cards. And then there are Three other people who I know have worked. In what is it that that fails on those, or how do they how do they? So it is a it's a it's a card that they had specifically built for them that mm -hmm. actually goes and plugs into a a, a Mac Tube CI or whatever, and that then talks to the IP IPX stack within all of the. How do they typically break down when they do break down? They, do they just pop one day uh, or? Yeah, uh, and, We're there. yeah, yeah. It's the same thing with our video cards. It tends to be a capacitor, mm -hmm. but at this point. When capacitors go out on those, we can actually pull them off and put another one on and keep it going. So, so it's not. We have lived in a world of disposable consumerism for so long that people <laughs> don't realize that you 
could fix something and get it back. Um, so here's if a, you here's have a, the knowledge, here's an here's an observation. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is something that I actually that I actually I see a lot is that there are people who understand the process of how to troubleshoot. They can actually understand how to do a word problem. Right? Mm -hmm. They understand the process of figuring out the joystick button doesn't work. Well, if it doesn't work, I should check and see the contacts on here. Click, peep, peep, peep. Okay, that works. I can test it here. I'm getting to here. I can test it to here. I'm getting to here. I test it on here. I'm getting here, but the top of the board isn't doing anything. Okay, it's not this. It's now this. And they don't understand the process of going through and right. how it works. I mean, when we were talking to somebody the other day, and we were trying to figure out how to do some lighting to be able to light up, uh, light up a barn, and I said, you know, at the end of the day, it's power, right? Mm -hmm. It starts at the positive, goes through, and comes out the negative. So whatever you do in between there, we can make all of that work, right? It doesn't matter what it is that you do. Um, unless you do LEDs and then it actually meant this direction. Uh, my specialty in the Coast Guard was uh, I was a gunner's mate. Uh -huh. I did a lot of, uh, I was a weapons technician for, yeah. on like the uh, Mark 38, uh, like a 76 millimeter cannon uh -huh. on, the, on, our, on the front of uh, our high endurance cutters. I had to do a lot of like mechanical and electrical troubleshooting and that kind of thing. Uh, and the, and the, I started using it to uh, fix pinball machines and shit, yep. you know, because it was, it was all, once I had the basic idea of, of of troubleshooting, it like, is. and but the thing is, I will tell you that in my experience, half the population can't do that. Well, and I don't know, I, I did have to go to a class for it. I don't know, but it's weird for me to not to, when it's a natural thing. I don't know how you teach somebody the process of figuring out how the logical progression and troubleshooting if you don't know how to do that. I don't know how to teach you how to do that, yeah. But just my throw experience, away but my experience, yes, people just, just we have had away. that we've actually had that thing. It's like, oh, I guess I'll have to replace that. They can replace something, but they don't know how to fix something, mm -hmm. and and so it's very interesting. And I, 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 I I'm, I'm all about being able to fix whatever it was, not necessarily have to replace it. And this just ties in perfectly with that because you don't get to replace it. You, you can if you, you want to. to. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to fix it instead of replacing things. We just can't. We just can't throw it away. It's a, about figuring out how it goes from there. It's like that seat back there. I got to figure out how to how to fix the. We have one of the seats that won't. Alright, so this is an illustration oh. of what you see when you sit down in, in front of the box. On your left, you're going to have a throttle. Uh, keep in mind, this is a throttle, not direction. So it's literally push it forward, go fast, pull back to stop. When you want to go in reverse, you hold the red button, push forward to go fast in reverse. So it is not forward, back, push it forward to go back. On your right, you have your joystick. It is flight joystick. So you will turn left, turn right. Pull back to look up, push forward to look down. Does not twist. Please do not twist the joystick. Alright, so uh, the two main buttons on this joystick you're going to be concerned with is the missile button on top and the trigger button that fires everything else. Depends on what you have. So machine guns, lasers, cannons, uh, all those kind of things. So it's basically missiles, guns. Right, through the front windshield here, the largest one here is your main view screen. There's a targeting reticle that's in the center. The point of this game is to turn to put that reticle on top of another mech. As soon as you have it on top of another mech, it turns red. As oh, soon thank as it turns you. red, you have a target, you have missile lock. Hit the button, fire the top button, number two, and it will launch those missiles and track that target. Okay? If you are, if that reticle is on either side of it, and it is not red, you're just going to launch missiles for nowhere, okay? So, in this round, we're going to do very simple. Uh, those are the really all you got to worry about. The pedal's not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, this is 
basic mode. So this is really run, gun, shoot, right? So once you get uh, used to this mode, come back to us. We're going to talk about advanced mode when all of these MFDs are functional. You can press and tell your weapons. You can uh, affect communications, check your own uh, damage, uh, check map, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the pedals will allow you to torso to us. So, so you can point. So this, gotcha. Yeah. While so, this, uh -huh. so right now, don't worry about torso twisting. It's going to be uh, this first round is going to be just learn how to run and go. Okay. Uh, later on, you'll be able to walk one direction, turn, and fire another direction. We'll get into that next next time. So that is all we have for this round. You can find your call signs up on the pod. Yeah. Preferably get in the pod with your name on it. Here. Thank you. you Thank you. Do you, you want to stand up? Give a Thank you. Hold on, hold on. Second place, red Why do you want to hurt me? Third place is red shadow. Five kills, eight deaths. Give yourself 166 points of damage to yourself. <laughs> wow. you, I'd like to apologize. You, you did not kill him oh, okay. at all the whole time. So congratulations. Let's see. Frog, you have four kills, twelve kills, and one on yourself. Yeah, I had to send him, but I took him out. I got killer wounded when I got him that's myself. That was the that that's was the all. important part. That was the important part. Boon Sulir, you got uh, six kills, eight deaths. And killed yourself twice. Yes. Awesome. That second place or fourth? Uh, that would actually be fifth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 I don't like that map. Uh, <laughs> like yeah, I, I hate that map. <laughs> yes. You're dead. You're dead. Like whatever. And for whatever reason, you were more in the middle than he was. That was that he spawned. It's like, hey man, uh, what about like he, he turned that on? It's like, oh! <laughs> I see you're a man of culture as well. I have like two sign up sheets. The ones that people are signing up to go and do. And then if you can get a sheet filled up with people who want to go hard, do all of that, I'll put it in and pass it. And the, like, the longer like, you go in a convention, the more names are on the other. Mm -hmm. So just like what, what you guys experienced, we just, I just want to come here, shoot some stuff. That's great. After a while, you take an extra some time to go. What are all these? And then you come out and say, do those work? Oh yeah, they work. They do that. Really? How do I get that? But going through what is 25 pages of a manual to go and show mm -hmm. what each of these buttons do, etc. We couldn't just do that over and over again, so you actually... You wait till they that. express an interest. And, 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 yeah. and the next, once you, like, once you start turning on ammo and heat and everything else, a lot of the balance issues, mm -hmm. you'll see where like somebody has one like one back, like, oh, I one shot, it's so terrible. It's like, once you start turning stuff on, yeah. you start seeing the weaknesses in some of the designs, that, like the Kodiak one, the Daishi Prime, that like... Oh, this is this is ridiculous. The gameplay is in the game. It's like once we turn heat ammo on, this thing is terrible because you can't shoot it without. Overheating. When you have something that's full of lasers, you shoot it once and you're you're, you're overheated and just sitting there. One shot. Yeah, you, you only get one shot unless you go in and split them off into different triggers, which is why you have other triggers. You can actually say, I want to fire half my lasers here. One, two, three. Half my lasers here. You can, you know, 
kind of start working your way through balancing those things out to make it a little different. Uh, so, but but especially in the longer cons, things like Dragon Con, where we're, we used to run 24 hours a day, but we're actually now 24 hour days, four days a week. Mm. Yeah. So now we run five days, but only run we don't run for six hours a day. 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. we don't. Run. Hmm. But the rest, but now we're running. We get there. We're running Thursday through Monday. So it's just one of those things. It gets harder and harder to get there. Um, you know, when the con started, so people would come a day earlier. Then they would come a day earlier. The next thing you know, the con is now five days long instead of three days long. The first time we went to Dragon Con, we were we had no expectation of what was going to happen. We didn't know how well it was going to be received. And then we we went ahead. We want this to be open 24 hours to make sure that we're getting as much in there as possible. Mm -hmm. And then we found out our first trip that we had a, uh, we were fully operational, game playing continually 24 hours a day, and we had a waiting mm -hmm. for three hours. Wow. 3 a.m. in the morning. And what year was that? The first convention that you did? No, this is the first Dragon Oh, Con. sorry, first Dragon first Con, sorry. Probably. Wow, it's so. It's it's it, when people actually try these things, it's it, it, there's enthusiasm. Like these guys are playing right behind. Oh, okay. So come over here. Advanced mode, uh, well, you'll hold it when, after it started. You'll hold that one down and then hit the one on the other side. Okay, so it's like a shift key, you'll have right. to hold it down, hit that, that, that one. Got it, I get you to it. All right, okay. Jam. You do what? Uh, I got this jam. I've selected it, but I don't know what, what button it's right here. Oh, thank you. Check them already. It'll be flashing. There you go. All right.
Where are you? I know. Where are you? Couldn't go easy on you. No. <laughs> <laughs> So the, what we got here is uh, one soother, one, got your one kill, scored 1,333 points of damage. Congratulations, sir. Thank and you. And Shadow, you did 519 points of damage. So, and then it is going to replay. Yeah. Now we got to replay up here. So a kill is basically 500 points. Um, the damage output minus the kill. So like when you blow the reactor it's five hundred points. Yeah. Um, so you had basically done about eight hundred points. And more importantly, you would put most of that damage center torso. Mm -hmm. You did an excellent job early of putting a whole bunch right down the middle. Whereas you've done a decent chunk of damage but you've gotten a leg, you've gotten a little C T, you got a little torso you got a little arm, like you would spread it out very, So we very were playing in, a, in a, an advanced mode, the center torso, or both legs, or what it takes to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Blow up their arms, blow up their torsos, blow up one leg, they're still standing, they're still going. Um, but in, in this one, you've got to kill the center torso, or or uh, both legs, in order to kill them. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's useful to know the front of the mech and the back of the mech are the same hit zone. Mm -hmm. So center torso here, center torso here, same thing. Nice. Awesome. Replay up there. Oh, sorry. Small screen on the right will actually show damage as it happens. Yeah, I got stuck on a wall for a minute there. Yeah, Off the wall. <laughs> that, that's the first hurdle. You have to get stuck on the wall. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see what the player is talking about. Uh huh. The different areas that we're going to get. Probably another innovative thing about the game is that like, different zones. Yeah. I don't need to see it, Dottie. I love it. That's right. And there, and there, are, <laughs> there are special areas as well mm -hmm. that can be a much faster kill. So there's there's a headshot is what we call it. So somewhere in your the cockpit that you're actually sitting, mm -hmm. you can just smash that and, and you can kill you can uh can you still pop eject ejection pods to, to delay respawn or you can you can eject and yeah. and then respawn 
in this case, it wasn't the wrong weak spot in the game you were right, in. Right, right. ejected you to lose. Right. Um, but ejecting loses 500 points. Kale was 500 points. So, if, so when you, even if you go up to somebody and, and eject, it explodes, and that explosion will help with you potentially kill them. Mm -hmm. You lose as many points as you gain. Unless there's two of them here, right. then you might be able to actually you know, I'm, I'm Naruto running. I'm going this way with my arms out. There's a miracle life that doesn't happen for the first time out. Popular. What? Like, they don't, it doesn't get, uh, here's, I have a, you're, I have a question about Red Planet, and this yeah. is, this is going right now. Yeah. How often does it even get played anymore? Because you don't play at conventions, you don't, you, it's not advertised anymore. Oh no, like, there's a devoted following around. Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah? So how often, how often do, you, do games happen here? They ha well, they happen up, upon request. Sure. Yeah. But like yeah. every, every couple months? Every couple, like, a couple no, no, times a year? It's, like, it's, it's, if, if some of the regulars are not here, it's, uh -huh. it's probably like months. Like, huh. It'll be like a couple times a month. But uh, those who come in and understand what these are, that's one of the first questions that comes yeah, up. Yeah, like, because it's the only way to play it. Right. You can't it's fucking... The only, yeah. It's the only way. Exactly. Oh. But at conventions, we get the same thing. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that a uh, player, first time you play it, you, you played in arcade mode. And after a while, you get the itch, you want to play something a little more challenging. Yeah. And then one of our regulars go, so you like the advanced games about it, right? You know there's another game? What? <laughs> and then they want to know more. They say, hey, there's a racing game. What? Mm -hmm. and then, or, like I say, there's, there's a lot of times some people who actually know what these are will come up at a convention and go, you wouldn't happen to have. Hey, 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 can you help our brother out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we probably. You know one of the thoughts I've had about about how we the, you could potentially preserve the, sort of this experience without the physical pods, I've, I've, have you or anyone considered like VR emulation of these cockpits, like they do for some uh, flight I, simulators in VR? Or? I know that there are some guys talking about that. Uh, because that would be one way to keep it alive in some sense, even once all these end up right. in the in the dumpster somewhere. So they, like. There's different lines of thought on that. I know. Yeah. The modern crowd, the younger crowd, would probably like to go that direction. I'm more old school. Mm -hmm. I like tactile. Well, here's tactile yeah, I feel of it. But here's here's so. what I'm thinking is that like in the in the in the universe con conceded the VGL, you sell them as trainer training software, mm -hmm. and then you say this is a, just a taste of what you could have mm -hmm. if you actually show up here and play this. Good in the same in the same way that showing people at conventions, it'd make it easier to. Show this stuff to people, and then you say, "Well, this isn't the real experience. You want <laughs> right. the real experience? Yeah. You come over here." Like. Yeah, that, <laughs> I think I'm gonna say that's above my licensing. Oh, uh, I know, I know. Grade, I've so. just I've been thinking about all yeah. this stuff no, lately. I get you. I get yeah, you. Uh, I think I think as far as technology is concerned, it could happen now. It's yeah, getting that good. Uh, it, it hasn't been well enough to do. I mean, we all know. Uh, was it the Steel Battalion when they tried yes. to do? Uh, yep. Think, think away. But, um, I mean, it's getting to the point where it's more likely. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's there's a whole lot of licensing questions there. Yeah, that well, have to be I hear you. There, so. All right. I'll probably just go with something basic to, be, to get my bearings again. It's, I haven't played it since 2012, so okay. it's, it's been a... No probably just the barge. Yeah, so, so a, a, a barge, a, a, a T-Ran, a, a... The Mule. The Mule, something like that. My, my, it's been a so The T-Ran and the... Uh, what's the other one called? Bull. Bull. Broccoli. T-Ran or a Screaming Broccoli. Alright, let's do the Screaming Broccoli. I'm gonna get Red Shadow in here. Uh, do you have a particular color scheme that you would like? Do you get to pick a color? Uh, industrial Yellow. You get to be yellow. And then if you're gonna be yellow, you also then get to choose a uh, color a pattern. So, Celtic, Desert, Flames, Giraffe, Hawaiian, uh, lion, sure. Lion it is. Alright, for you. 
Yes, sir. So we're going to do uh, red planet. Red planet is vector thrust vehicle. So we're talking about a hovercraft with Genesis takeoff rockets attached to it uh, that we're going to be flying in a low gravity area. So it's kind of a flying game, but it's more, it's not flying, it's really flying. It's the flying lower up. the ground you are, the faster you'll go. Right. Six. What that means is that uh, left and right are side slip left and right. So it becomes light flying. Pushing down makes you go down, pulling back makes you go up, so it's light flying. Your pedals are a rudder. They turn you left and right. They, they turn the vehicle. Keep in mind that you can just turn the vehicle and continue going that direction. It'll take a while before it, it, it gets there. You'll slide into that. It's like hovercraft. It's a hovercraft. So when you're closer to the ground, you'll go faster. But you also, there will be times when you need to go higher. If you need to go higher and, and get there, there's a technique that you can use. The trigger is actually going to be lift cut. What that does is it takes your fans, turns them backwards, and so you actually drop, but you go faster, but you drop when you do that. So there's a technique where you can actually lift cut, push down, and right before you hit the ground, let go and pull back and you'll go, and you'll bounce up off the ground. That's how you can get over obstacles and, and things like that. Uh, when you run into somebody else hard enough, then that will actually kill you. And then what we're doing, we're going to actually be on a on a, uh, a mine that actually has some obstacles in the middle. And there's actually a, a, a drill, a laser drill down here and down here. And there's going to be a little score zone that will be marked on the floor. You're going to want to actually hit the score zone and then come back out. You just got to make loops back and forth. Okay. And you'll we're know doing when it's you this one. Zone. Yeah, we're doing this one. It's called Liz's Lane. So it'll just be a, a simple score zone down to a score zone. So we're going to start you off with go something Go around simple. the pylon. Yep, go around the pylon or if you're... Basically if you're, it'll be real easy. Go straight, <laughs> turn, turn around, around in a circle, <laughs> go straight. Yeah, it'll be fine. There's, There's nothing that can things, Including each other going the other direction that you have to avoid. No, all right. You actually don't need to worry about avoiding people nearly as much as I do, which I can't touch anymore. So, you see easy. the little guys going real fast? Hit them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Run them over. Get extra points. That one. <laughs> now, we, we, there, there are like car horns on it, so yes, we are honking at you. Another way I think it was ahead of its time. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go and hit the also, old Also, if you hear a beeping button. sound, don't worry about it. Just keep driving yeah. straight. <laughs> Seventeen thousand points. <laughs> Good job there. And then Tiger, who was in first place for a short period of time, and then lost it there. The ball. <laughs> Hank, second <laughs> place there. Fourteen thousand in second awesome. place. They are awesome. Martyr, you know, you just quickly went and stood, you know, firmly in, in third place there. You have almost had it at the place very place end. I, I almost sure got it. Yeah, and then and then uh, Frog, I just I just went through and then die 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 die. die. <laughs> yeah, it just kept me down there. Uh, fifth place for Red Shadow, and we got sixth place still and a positive score. That's that that doesn't always happen the first time. <laughs> Two <laughs> One lap. Good lord, what yeah, happened? Sixteen deaths. What was your fastest lap? How many times did you kill me there, um, Tiger? Nine. One oh nine. Damn! Look at one oh eight. Damn! By, by a fucking Hi. second. Casual, not casual. Wasn't even trying. 
It was just I was the person going into those baits with the with the with the oh. pack. You just happened to be the guy that was going on the fast line. Yeah. And, and I know where the fast line is. And you were the guy who knew where the fast line was. I'm like, I'm like, I'm way over here in this little spot that you can't even go through. Going through this one, I'm like, there's a net back there. How did he even get it there? You just had to go away. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I dropped the jetpack and it slid so over. So you can do that. You come up and fall over. Keep going. That's exactly what happened. I know. I know.
Damn it. You got me, Kenneth!
kids. Oh, better than last time. Yeah. How about you? Been... <laughs> I rounded a corner and I felt like it wasn't awful. <laughs> That's a start. Yeah. All right, so I'm at 25,000. I'm used to this being at 45,000. <laughs> Without all the depth hangs in there. Different you know, place. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Tiger, you got second place over there, man. Shot. Yeah, yeah. All right. Murder. Ooh, came up at the last second. It must have been when I hit when I ran into you. So yeah. Help give you some extra points there. Fourth place for Mr. Red Shadow. Oh, yeah. Fifth place for Moon Shooter. Thank you. I'm going to say firmly. I'm not I'm not really not bad back. What's your fastest slap, Kev? Uh, 116. Oh, 102 over here. 32. 32! Goodness. What's so, the winning? One twenty. Uh oh. What, what happened? Can <laughs> be a little frustrating. Somebody has to sit down with you and show you exactly how to run the maps. And again, as things go, that was a fairly simple map. There are other maps that are much more difficult than that. And, and somebody literally has to sit down and say, "Okay, go here. Now hit the boost. Bounce here. Go up." Well, or else this game can be extremely frustrating. We got to do an interview with the. Uh, I know, I know. Let's let's have a second. I don't want to. I don't want to burn the rest of our time here without talking to these guys. So yeah, let's. Yeah, so let's do it. Uh, All right. You want to get back in here? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, let's. They'll, they'll start playing something. Do we have like a really bright light and shine right in my eyes? One, one bulb swinging from a yeah. wand? That would be <laughs> really... And I don't remember what we were talking about when we ended the... <laughs> Alright, so we're, we're, we're recording swing. now. Camera swaying? Yeah. I thought it was me that was swaying. That's... Here we go. How many beers? Get him another beer. <laughs> okay, so just to start off, uh, your name and your call sign. So my real name is Ernest. My call sign is Tiger, um, and that that is purely stolen. Um, so like everybody's got a, a story of their call sign. Mine is purely stolen from uh, my call sign while I was in the Marine Corps, which was Tiger. So. I, I wasn't very creative at all, so, yeah. Um, and when did you first encounter the pods? Uh, 2013, so I moved to Houston um, in 2013 for work. I actually had a friend who lived like across the street, one over from where the old store used to be. And I uh, went to the restaurant next door to the store for dinner, and I was walking to the gas station again so it was like restaurant the, the old store and 
gas station. And we're walking by, you know, and, and just going to grab the, the old gas station and an amazing beer and beer selection. So we're walking by and I, I, I'm doing like the walk and then I see the silhouette of a Mad Cat, Timberwolf, in the window and just do a double take because it's like, wait a minute, I know this. Like, I know this silhouette. And it was a, you know, Timberwolf, all right, I'm a dirty cleaner. But like, it, it was a Mad Cat like in the, in the window and I was like, holy crap, what is this? So the, the old storefront had um, a Mad Cat, a Thor, a Loki, and a Vulture um, in the windows. And it was like, but that was it. And then like on the front door, it was like closed, but the hours are, check the webpage. It was a little QR code thing. So I'm like, all right, let me break up the cell phone and, you know, like line up the QR code and whatever. And so um, I saw that and that was like a Friday night. And so regular night used to be Saturday. So next day I come in and I'm just starry eyed, like, what is this and how do I get involved? Um, and that was it. So that was 2013, probably like August, September time frame. And you were already in the service at the time? Or? I, I, been in for four years, already out, and oh, okay. like moved here, civilian world, like working in oil and gas. But got into this and like saw the pods and just just again starstruck. And it was like the the joystick of the pods is not terribly dissimilar from the control scheme of an actual tank. So I like fell right into it, and had an aptitude for it. Um, thank you, four years of the government paying for training. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so got into it that way and just, just fell in love and, and been doing it ever since. So, so what, what did you think the first time that you actually sat down and played the game? The, played so the first time, so I would played MechWarrior 4 before, um, at home, on a computer, like, and I got into it and I just had the moment of like, this is MechWarrior 4, but like a million times better, right? Like the, the software is functionally the same, but it, like, the cockpit's up, the actual, like, this this could, like, feasibly be the cockpit of a 75-ton mech, right? Like, this this could be it. And it was, just, again, starry-eyed and, like, you know, blown up, just crazy. They're like, this is a real thing. Like, this is something I can do. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was totally starstruck. I was, I was with it. And I, I still am. Like, I, obviously, I mean, like, I still get in here and it's like this is the it's almost like you know it's a real thing obviously it's not we've known some 70 ton max but it's it really handles like it is and it, it really feels like it is and it's something totally different from say you know Fortnite or MechWarrior Online or like any of the other multiplayer games that we have that are modern and current and cool like this is something totally different and, and it's own thing how many missions have you had? Have you run? Um, over a thousand. Oh, you go. Oh. So yeah, I got the thousand mission pen, and so that actually is really funny because I I think it's closer to about thirteen or fourteen hundred because I didn't keep like the first two two and a half years of doing this I didn't keep the record sheets, and so I didn't start keeping the record because we we didn't have the pins right so like we didn't have the pins so like it didn't make any difference I couldn't not do it and then uh, highlight actually one of the other volunteers started getting into it and, and doing it and there was some talk and maybe we can get the pins and it's like alright well, well I'll start I'll start collecting my record sheets and and he and I showed up like every Friday night for years at this point and we're totally regular about it and he ended up getting his thousand mission pin the week before I did, you know, even though he started a few years after me, because it's like he he was really good about it, and he his influence is what made me like, all right, yeah, yeah, I'll start collecting them, and sooner or later we'll get the pins. Um, so yeah, like the week before I did, he he got his thousand missions, and we we tried for the last like six months. He wanted to do it at the end of I think 2019, and it was like for the last six months we would get in the store a little bit early. And, and run duels like me and him just just the two of us no return run duels so that like we could get missions in and then try to get it by the end of the year because he needed something like 
300 in the last three months or something, and we did it. So uh, you mentioned that uh, in the service you used a simulator for training, kind of similar to this. Or? Yeah. So um, I was a uh, 1802, which is a tank officer in the Marine Corps, uh, and up at Fort Knox, which is where we did tank training, we had. I, I think it was a battalion level simulator. It was a lease company. I think it was battalion level. But I mean, it was a, ba a bunch of a bank, really, of tank sims that functioned effectively network wise just like this, where it was, you know, here's here's your company or, or battalion of tanks, and and we had tank commander, gunner, driver, all in the sims, and they were all linked together. So you'd be running missions. Well, this is functionally the same thing, where it's you know, okay, so it's a company of mechs as opposed to tanks, but, you know, it's everybody's locked in together, everybody's playing the same mission, everybody's going up against each other, and it was very much the same sort of experience of, you know, force on force coming at, after each other, and, and, you know, or force on, you know, AI, which, you know, the AIs are never brilliant, but it's like, they're a lot better gunners than a human is, right? Because they, they just they just automatically hit because of their program too. Cheat. So yeah, yeah, the cheaty tech, right? Like, uh, but it but it really forces you. Uh, one of the things we do here is something called the level nine bot challenge. The level nine bots automatically hit center mass every time they fire. It's like that's their programming. They pull the trigger and it hits center mass. Well, the AI for the tank sims, same deal. Where it like. If you turn the AI on and you let it go, it hits center mass every time, right? So it's always hidden. So the only way to beat it is superior tactics. You, like, you've got to be better in the head because you are definitely not better at aiming. Period. The end. Not happening. It's programmed that you can't be better than that. So um, that's something we did a lot there that here, the level nine bot challenge, exact same thing on a you know amateur level, basically. So... Uh, when did you start getting involved with volunteering, and what was, what was the first time you, you helped out? So I started getting involved with volunteering in 2015, so five years ago. So I'd, I'd been coming up to the store regularly, um, and I, I had gotten laid off at work, um, and so I had a bunch of free time. And so, like, I still came up to the store, this was what I did on Saturday, this was basically the, the only social thing I did while I was laid off. Um, but I had free time, and they're like, oh, well, you know, you're always up here, decent pilot, like, you know, we go on the road. What do you mean, we go on the road? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, you know, like, we go to a convention, whatever. You... It's like, I've never been to a convention. I've never been to, to Con Palooza here in Houston or, or Dragon Con or anything. Like, I've never been to a comics convention. It's like, I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm happy to go along. <laughs> um, you know, and it, it was great. Like it was, it's an amazing amount of fun, and something that like, if you're not already into that sort of thing, if that's not something you already do, you wouldn't necessarily get the the chance to. But it's an incredible amount of fun, and even moving the pods in the the, the actual labor part of it is uh, it is a great deal of fun in terms of like preserving something that's really incredible, but that at this point, is a, is a little long in the tooth as technology goes, right? But the, the technology itself, the the gameplay, the the construction, whatever, was so far ahead of its time. It's so good that it sort of transcends the fact that it's it's old tech, right? Like, and and it's appropriate, really, because you know, for the universe for BattleTech, it's like the best technology was Lost Tech. I mean, it was the old Star League stuff. And it's like. It feels appropriate that older tech, you know, something that was made nearly as old as I am, um, is so much fun to play and is, is such a sort of gem. Uh, uh, how many conventions do you think you've been to now that you've worked at, and what's your favorite part of doing the, the work at conventions? Um, so all told, uh, I don't know, 10 conventions, give or take, at this point. Uh, favorite part is either the wonderful living conditions of everyone cramming in like sardines going to conventions and the, uh, the camaraderie that engenders or 
the uh, the drive to and from. So it, so all the balls are like really lovely people, and like it's a lot of fun, you know, making the drive to and from either you know like in a car with a bunch of people, and it it's all cramped, and then like you know obviously we're doing it because of you know love of the game so to speak, as opposed to because we're we're rolling in cash for doing it, right? So everybody's really really cool. Everybody's really fun to be around, and like everybody's real love for for doing it, and and so more so than like most things you deal with in life people are there because they want to be um and that leads to like a lot of really fun interesting people that you wouldn't otherwise get to interact with getting to spend time with them and and yes in sort of close quarters and, and trapped in a room and or a car and whatever but it's it's a so much fun like it's a, a really community building activity sort of deal so um uh, as a, a, a veteran myself as well, uh, when I started doing research on the background on these, uh, with the Lost Tech documentary, they talk about a whole uh, uh, bridge simulators, aeronautical simulators, that kind of thing is an inspiration. And I've been thinking a lot lately um, about this intersection of the military and video games in a lot of different aspects. Like, uh, there's the business relationship, or, or like, uh, they, they explored VR way before it was ever available to consumer hands because they can afford to. Yeah. And then there's the, the training aspect, right, where, um, you know, you lose, uh, these aren't realistic, you know what I mean? Like... Well, it, it's funny, so, like, they, they are and they aren't, and I say that, you know, you, you've got to suspend realism for a moment to, to recognize that bipedal mechs, right, are, are not a viable weapons platform. Like, you, you're just not. It's not a Bipedal motion is inherently unstable. Like, the, the the weight distribution of something that's, you know, 75, 100 tons on two feet, you're going to be sinking them in the ground. You can't go across bridges. You can't move. So there, there's a certain suspension of disbelief. There's, there's a certain suspension of physics and realism that, that comes with this. On the other hand, some of the things, uh, NARC beacon, C3 systems, the sort of coordination between lance mates, you know, depending on what sort of scenario you're running, some of that is very realistic in terms of the communication required and the understanding of the capabilities and limitations of the different vehicles, you know, and mechs. Some of that really does translate. The, the situational awareness, the knowing where you are, where your lance mates are, and how you want to engage certain certain enemies does like it is a real thing and is something that you know skills that you would have say from the military do translate and, and like are really useful and like one of the things that I think a lot of the newer players don't appreciate you know is like range bands where like certain weapon systems are great at certain ranges and like certain mechs are great at certain ranges I and mean, not as good at different ranges. And knowing how to exploit that and, and use that is something that, you know, this really does well as a simulator in that you, certain mechs do certain things really well. And they do certain things very poorly. So there's more overlap there than you'd, look, you'd think just from a, like a, a quick look at the, the software and the technology. How, how would you say this, your relationship with these, these pods uh, has affected your life? Have you gained like, friendships or...? Yeah, so I am... Um, so when I, when I got here, like I said, I got here in 2013, every, I didn't know a single soul in town. Um, there was one other, one other uh, officer who ended up being here shortly thereafter, so I, I knew one person. Otherwise, all, all my friends, everybody I knew was, was people I worked with. Um, now, for the last like, two and a half, three years, um, I have spent, uh, like once a month, I, I GM a Battletech, which is the, the IP, right? Um, I GM a tabletop Battletech game with five of the regulars. So, um, you know, I have guys that I, I hang out with outside of this, on my own free time, you know, that I, I talk to every other day or so on, you know, we got a, a Facebook Messenger string and, you know, like we talk regularly and we're, we're all friends now because of this. Um, and there, there are 
you know, a couple of balls that, that aren't on that, but that I, again, I talk to fairly regularly that are friends just because of this, this hobby. Um, and it, it really is, outside of work, like the thing that's made me the most friends in Houston. Does, it, does anybody else have any questions that they ask? Okay. Is cool. there anything else you'd like to no, say? No, no, no. Does, does Tiger come from the fact that you're a redhead? No, uh, Tiger comes from the fact that uh, I was attached to 2 2 Warlords, which is an uh, infantry battalion in the Marine Corps. And we were on the 22nd Mew, and they needed a call sign for tanks. And they were like, you know, it was one of those things where they forgot to, like, say, hey, everybody figure out your call sign. So we're, like, in, in a meeting with the battalion commander. You know, like, what's everybody's call signs? Like, AVs, tanks, like, and you're sitting there on the spot, and it's like, uh, T, T, uh, Tiger. Cool. Right. Now, that was it. Um, actually, so for fun stories, I do actually have one story that I want to tell. The best con story I have was 2018, 19, I think it was last year, actually, 2019. So, every year for the cons, uh, Dragon Con in particular, so we have most kills, highest score, and most, most suicides. Those are the, the three things we get up on the board. And so, you know, people, people compete on this, and it's a whiteboard, and it's just, you know, basically the, the traditional high score thing. So there was a, a, she was probably like 10 or 11 years old, like a, a young girl, who was there with her brother and her dad. And, like, she realized she was not going to win high score. She wasn't going to win most kills. But she was like, I think I can get the most suicides. And, and you know, we're, we're setting up the console, and she was talking. She was like, all right, so how exactly do I suicide? You know, and we went through, and I was like, all right, so if you if you happen to get legged, you hit the, cell, the eject button, and, and you go in. It's like, okay. So she did that a few times, and she did pretty decent, I, I mean, I think it was like five or six suicides, and it's like, it was, she won for a minute, but then like somebody else had more suicides, and, like, and she was like really, really upset, because she was like, I, I really, like, I can't, I can't get the other ones, but I really think I can get this one, it's like, all right. So we ended up going through, and she must have played, I don't know, 10 or 15 games, and like, each game, she was she was just trying to get suicides and doing great, but not quite getting there. And it's like finally we set up a game where it was like, you know, we went started started turning on features to help her out. You know, and, and like game fifteen, she goes in. It's like she's in a Hollander two C or a Hollander, and you know figures out if I dump all my ammo. I can self-destruct. And so, heat was on, or excuse me, heat was off, but ammo was on, which is the, the regular basic mode. Like, if you don't press any of the buttons except basic, that's what happens, right? And I was like, okay, you got this. And she, she went up, and she would just spawn in, dump ammo, and go running for the nearest enemy, and self-destruct. And it's like, she had 20-some-odd suicides which each suicide is minus 500 points but her total score for the game was only like minus 3000 because not only did she suicide but she went in and got up in everybody's face and did it and and got something like 15 or 16 kills in the process and she came out of it and you could see as she left the pod the glow in her face cuz she knew she nailed it it wasn't like sort of, kind of, like I'm not sure how I did. It was pure joy of not only did I succeed in what I set out to do, and she did, she had like 21 suicides, right? So not only did I succeed in what I set out to do, but like I was competitive in the game, and she did. And it's like by rights, she should have been at minus 10,000 points. At the end of the game, she was just shy of minus 3,000. And again, blew away the competition in suicides. And it was like the the joy, just the pure joy, trollishness of the whole thing was 
priceless. I'll never forget it. Like, so much Where fun. else can you have a long career as a suicide bomber? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, it was absolutely great. And it was, like, you want to talk about, like, people having just childlike joy. I mean, that, that was a child who just had absolutely pure, unadulterated joy. Not being the best pilot in here, but just playing the game. You know, and it was great. It was so much fun. It totally made my con. So that was awesome. Funniest suicide story I've ever heard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was so good. And her call sign was Stinky, too. That was the other one. It's her call sign was Stinky, which somehow just felt right for what was going on, you know? So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How about you? Clay. <laughs>
we couldn't find the keys to the truck that year. So it probably took us an hour. We were an hour behind just because we couldn't find, somebody couldn't find the keys. Uh, and then, you know, you have different truck, you know, the, we had a truck driver that was part of our uh, group. So he actually had the, you know, a license to drive a big rig truck. So you know, I was in his rig and Frog was driving the other one. So we were split. Uh, the different people were in different uh, trucks. And, you know, you get to know the people that you're in the truck with pretty well. And the funny part is, as, has, as has been said before, people know you by your call sign. So yeah, you're involved in a whole community and they don't know me as Clay, they know me as Martyr. And sometimes when we're going to a convention, well, there's a Facebook group for the people that are going. And people have start out with their real names and they're all chatting and talking and they're like, what the crap is that? So we have to change our name from our real names to our call signs. That's great. How many conventions do you think you've done? I don't know, six or seven. Uh, do, you, do you have any good stories? Or? Yeah, the first time I went it was a MechaCon and again, there was a history there where the, the people that had this shelf that sort of moved in a hypnotic way and I, I was sitting around standing, you know, talking to people, and all of a sudden this young lady comes in and runs right up to Frog uh, and obey the hypno shelf. This is not a cult. I'm like, what have I got myself? What is going on? What? And it's very strange. And we, uh, we, we measure how easy the cons are by how many flat tires we had. Hey, we only had two flat tires this con. That was easy. And we were on our way, I think, to MechaCon or something, and, and Frog was ahead of us. And all of a sudden, I just hear this giant explosion. And I'm like, oh, my God, what happened? And they're like, hey, I just had a flat tire. And normally, a flat tire is like a big deal, but these guys have flat tires so much they carry like three or four tires ready to go. They're all pumped up, ready to go. So we pulled over, and, you know, and 10 minutes later, we're back on the road. Yeah, no big deal. So, you know, the, the, that, I, that sticks out in my head. And just uh, at Dragon Con, just loading in, I mean, after you, it takes a day, a day and a half to get from Houston to Atlanta. So you're fairly tired, you're strung out from the road, and now you've got to set all this stuff up. But the worst part is at the end of Dragon Con, when you're just absolutely blown away and exhausted, it's all you can do to stand up. Now you've got to pack everything again and, and bring it into the truck and go home for another day and a half. And you're like, oh, my, why am I doing this? <laughs> and it's just uh, w one thing that really sticks out in my head is the community. I was telling these guys earlier, uh, the pods get beaten up. They take a lot of abuse on the, on the roads. And then after the convention season uh, at the store, people would come in, the very tech savvy group as a whole, and they would come in and they would start to repair the pods. And I remember one day when they were doing that, I, I didn't know, I don't know anything about it. Uh, and half the pods were disassembled. There was all this stuff on the floor. People were just running around fixing stuff. And I leaned over and I told Muerte to that it's amazing how passionate that the group is, that they take time on their own to come in on a Saturday, like at noon or something and they're working fixing the pods and then they work till six and then we put everything back together and then we start playing at six and then we leave at midnight. What do you think it is about the pods that's engendered this, um, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, love? The sense of community, yeah, the yeah. love. Um, it's just, if you like, I mean, there are people that like video games and there are people that don't. But I think if you're the kind of person that likes a video game, this game is, simple on it can be simple but if you turn it into advanced mode and start programming you know like if you're in if you're playing in advanced mode your weapons generate heat your mech can shut down so then you can start programming spreading your weapons around on different buttons to dissipate the heat or not generate as, as much heat so it can be as complex as you want or it can be as simple as you want it just depends on how you want to play and, you know, Saturday night, uh, a bunch of people can come together and they don't have to talk about work. They don't, they can just have fun doing what they want to do. They can get pizza 
uh, bring it in or cokes or beers or anything. They can, you know, they can uh, let the weight of the world off their shoulders. So, so knowing how much work it is to go to the conventions, why, why, why still go to the conventions? I don't know. It's just, you know, <laughs> several of the times, you know, you guys called or yeah. and said, hey, you know, somebody dropped out at the last minute. Hey, man, can you can you fit in? And I was like, yeah, sure. And there was one time I started a company and there was a number of people that, that worked for me. And, you know, it was one of these times these guys called, hey, somebody dropped out. Can you come? And I was like, OK. And I didn't check back into work, and they were convinced that I was dead or something. I, uh, <laughs> they, they, you know, they, when I got back in, they were like, oh, my God, we were trying to call you all this time. Look, where were you? What happened? And, you know, it's just one of those things where you kind of have to drop everything and, yeah. and go. But it's that sense of community that we, we all, I don't know, we're, we're, we've all become friends that we want to make sure that we continue to do whatever is needed. You know, it's just what you did. Yeah, totally. All right, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I think that's about it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Would, you, would you guys like to, I don't know, what time is it? We have five minutes. Oh, shoot. <laughs> well, if you, you want to, uh, one question maybe? Maybe yeah, if there's anything Go you guys want to put out there? Uh, I mean, what do you get? I mean, is there a chance to say anything if you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, I, I, I mean, so so for us, oh, sorry. Yeah, am I, am I the thing? Closer to the, yeah. There we go. I mean, for, for me, there you go. It's it's just it's just one of those things where the the goal here really is to build a community. We actually have thought it'd be nice to be able to do something here where we could actually make a living off of this, but we realized a long time ago that wasn't going to happen. So we're making it run, making it operate, keeping it going, and just and just continuing through as we get get tired, want to figure out what to do. It's like man, there's all of this stuff of what we have to do of booking everybody to get everybody into the conventions that we need to do to make sure we have a staff volunteered up for that uh, for when parties call and we need to be able to get party things taken care of um, and and it's just it's just all of this so we're we you know we told everybody we think we're gonna you know we might just stop and everybody's like well I'll, I'll, I'll take on taking care of all of that so uh, Meep has been taking care of our, our party planning for six or seven years now right so she just, those emails come through, phone calls come through, she returns those phone calls, returns those emails. She was the one that got the email from you, forwarded it over to me and said, hey, you might want to talk with this guy. And we just, you know, we, we keep those things going. Um, uh, Diablo takes care of getting everybody together for, for the conventions and make sure that we have enough volunteers to be able to run that, puts the shifts together, takes off care of all of those things. Where they're still putting together and doing you know, uh, newsletters, press releases. We have other people who have, who have done that from time to time as we go through and create that. Um, so it's just it's just awesome having a, a community of people who want to do this. And it has been a it's been a real struggle for us in this pandemic time frame, not getting together with each other all the time. Um, and so I mean, we're used to seeing each other every week uh, and doing those things. So during uh, when it first started, we actually lit up the Twitch channel and started going through and sitting down. We'd go over to um, when uh, uh, Tiger was GMing the the, the, the the board game and actually, you know, put that out there for people to be able to watch. We when you got 50 subscribers on a Twitch channel doing doing playing a board game, the first week, you just you know it's like you know you still have this community that still wants to get together still wants to interact, still wants to do things. And and so we just continue to go from there. And now as we're, we're we get through the point of moving here, all, all these guys, there were there were a few of us that, you know, Wirt and I, we, we, we did a lot of trying to move things here, but it was just as much a bunch of the other folks who got together and helped disassemble the store, move everything over here, reassemble everything, get it into store, get some of our other stuff over into storage and take care of those things. So it's, it's awesome having this community of, of uh, friends who will just you know get take care of whatever needs to be taken care of for us to be able to keep this going and then and now we're actually now i mean it's just started we just started talking it's like you know we need to go ahead and get it back to where we have a regular you know we know where everyone's coming up here on saturday nights or whatever night it is that we're going to do so we, there's people are starting to put together 
and volunteer to say, I'll come work Saturday night and run the console so we can get everyone there. I'll come do it on the next Saturday, et cetera. So we're just starting that. That's just starting up again. We'll start it up next week or so uh, to actually have you know, our regular s series of things that are going on here. So we have a few different restrictions we have to deal with. We've got masks that we get to wear when, not when, when we're not you know, less than six feet apart. But you don't have to wear your mask when you're in the pod. So you can isolate it in there. And then we've got all the cleaning stuff, and we get to clean the pods after all the games and that kind of thing. So um, fortunately, when it first was happening, um, one of our guys actually said, huh, we're going to probably want to get some Lysol wipes. So he went and bought a, several packages of those and gave them to us so that we could actually clean all the pods. So we still have Lysol wipes that we've been able to use um, <laughs> to be able to keep this going. But that's been, they've been gone for six months, but we still have them. We still have some around because because of that. Um, so it's just, but it, it's been great having a, a community, and that's really I think what it was that we saw when it was at Dave and Buster's that was missing was to organize a community and to, to get people together and realize it's not it's not just this money making arcade game that sits over here and you don't do anything with it. It's something where we actually get together and, and getting everyone together is what it is that makes it fun. And why it is that something that's twenty something years old, the software is even the, you know twenty you know almost twenty years old is still relevant today. Okay, and that's 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 the one thing I've noticed is that you know in my life at the, the different intersections I've come across these things and at like the airlock in Washington for example. Yes. And every time I've, I've shown up to them, there's always a community there. Yes. It's always very tight knit. And then I, and then I mentioned the ponds that I played in Colorado and the guy that works the store. Oh, oh you mean so and so? Yeah, like, yeah, that's exactly Pharaoh. Yeah, that's about, Pharaoh. You know, yeah. like. <laughs> His real name now we know is Craig. But hey, it was Pharaoh. <laughs> it's remarkable. It's something that's something that's kept me interested in this. Even not even being able to play it, just right. knowing that it's out there, that this that there's a community of people getting together to do this kind of thing. That's right, and and people, it just becomes ingrained in in, in people. So, the three O pods that I had, I ended up actually selling to a guy, who, so he was. Uh, he was at Dragon Con, and he came up and he saw these and was like, these are like the next generation of the pods I used to play in Pasadena. And he played the three O pods in Pasadena. He said, I, I used to play those. I was in the Navy, and we, we went out on maneuvers and came back, and it was gone. And I, But I played it all the time, and then they just disappeared. And I haven't seen them now for 15 years, and you have, you have you know, the, these pods here. I said, yeah, I still actually have some of the, the old ones. And, and so it turns out that what I had... I actually had the, had a set of the pods from Pasadena. That's where they had come from. They'd gone through back and forth across the country a couple of times, and and uh, um, we had just hauled them back from Pasadena again. They actually ended up back in Pasadena again. They went across to Michigan, back to Pasadena, and back out here. Um, he he was like, w would would you sell them? I'm like, dude, I don't know that you. I mean, it, all of the electronics it takes to be able to keep these things up and running and operational. He's like. Dude, I'm an, I was an electronics technician in the in the Navy. I'm I'm an oscilloscope guy. I can sit down and work. I'm like, oh, all right. He's like, I really don't want to sell them. I have I have no interest. In, so just name a price. And I'm like, and so I told him my I don't want to sell them for this price. And he said, Do you take PayPal? And I'm like, crap. I just sold them. My pot. I didn't intend to sell those, but I wasn't going to refuse. This is the amount of money I wasn't going to refuse. So I ended up actually selling them to him. He, he had me actually put them in a storage locker for him. Um, and then he was going to work on how to get out from Jacksonville and be able to pick them up. He never was able to do that. He ended up, you know, with some medical bills and ended up turning around and selling them to another guy that we know that, that actually has probably two more sets of those pods. And he came out, met me, got the key, saw them and everything, said, cool, closed the door. And those pods are still next to my house in a storage locker where they have been for seven years probably in that storage locker that's just around the corner from my house where somebody's paying storage for him to be there. And I'm just like, and, and I, 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 have, I have actually reached out to him multiple times. I'm like, you interested in selling those again? And it's like, you haven't come and got them. And he's like, no, no, they're good. Just my spare parts for when any of these you know, fail, I'll be able to have the spare parts I need to be able to keep those, keep them running. So we reached out to him multiple times and actually um, 
uh, the guy in Pasadena that I bought those pods from, he's actually now bought uh, the set that's up in Dallas, and he, we, he and I have been talking, and I think I'm going to end up actually delivering them to him, so there may be a, a chance to be able to do that. And I've actually been talking to the other guy and said, uh, while I'm going, I could fit these on the trailer. Do you want me to bring them? I can bring them to California. Like he still needs to get them up, you know, further up into Seattle to, to be able to get them where he needs them. And so, so it hadn't worked out yet, but I, 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 it's like, you know, I could make a triangle if you want to do that. And he's like, nah, they're, they're still fine where they are in storage. So, so they're there. So I'll, I'll uh, let those people identify themselves. I don't know, identify everybody that has both pods. You can actually go. I think it's on Virtual Worlds. Is it on the wiki page or is it on the? It's on the Facebook group for Virtual World. If you go to Virtual World Entertainment Facebook group, Facebook, there's actually I think a sticky post that actually has a link to a Google Sheet that actually shows where all the pods are. Um, so anybody who said that I do have pods, you, know, you can actually find details there. Other people, there are there are ones that are listed there, the ones that are in private hands. Um, and we've actually come across somebody else who who says they have a set of pods in a warehouse actually in Texas. Um, he bought a set of the of these with the former hardware in them, so same shell but former different hardware in them, um, and says he has a set of those. I haven't, we haven't been able to verify that and to be able to go and validate that he has them, but he has, he had pretty darn intimate knowledge for me to not believe that he actually did have a set of those, but uh, he used to own a, own a car dealership here in in Houston, he used to play with his son all the time over at uh, Dave and Buster's. And at some point, after selling the car dealership, he actually bought pods so he could he could take those and play them. You know, get his son to come over where he was over near Louisiana and actually be able to, to, to play there. And so uh, uh, it's a, it's one of those random stories that comes along when somebody walks into a con and goes, "Oh my God, I thought these were all these were all gone, um, but they are actually still." Operating there, there, it's not lost tech. You know, we actually have the, you know, the, the, the thought of that, but the tech is still going. It's still running. We're going to keep them running. Um, there's, there's nothing we haven't been able to figure out how to get around at, at, at this point. Um, we lost the guy that actually used to rebuild the Rio boards for us. So now it's time for us to learn how to do that. Right? Set up a crash cart learn how to work our way through all of those pieces and parts and, and, and keep those going. So that'll be the that'll be the next thing. But we have a whole community of people who will figure it out and we'll keep it all running. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. All right. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> really. Excellent stuff. <laughs>
thousand missions in the old location with an extra thirty. You know, like yeah, but then there's all those wooden ones. Yeah, well, and then you got the duels in there. And the duels are quicker. One and a half. Well, except, except, I am not a quick dealer. Because I always do the, like, passive radar. Let's see if I can get a good clean shot before the other guy sees me. Thing. Right. So that burns four to five minutes That's before true. we ever see each other. Yeah. Which is, again, there are shysty tricks to, to dueling. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, that's then, always then some console operator like you would put you on, you know, big city. Yeah, oh um, yeah, yeah, opposite yeah. the <laughs> thousand <laughs> miles away. Take you four minutes if you knew exactly where. Yes, yeah. oh, yeah. there's one last photo on this. Yeah, I want okay. you to take it.